Uh, Mike Vogel is here, and I'm excited for this one. We're here to learn about some of the work, Mike, that you've done into Moore's Law. So welcome. Great. Thanks, Rob. Happy, happy to be back on the podcast. Excellent. Now, as I understand it, Moore's Law isn't a... Um, it's not a law in the same way that we talk about Newton's laws of motion or the laws of thermodynamics. It's more of a prediction that has driven really jaw-dropping advancements in technology in the world of computing over the last uh, 50 or 60 years. Uh, and so as we dive in here, Mike, can you just share why you chose to do a deep dive into this topic? Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Rob. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. So you know, electronics are everywhere now. They're they're not just in computers. They're in they're in cars. They're in industrial equipment. They're in our thermostats. Um, and and these advancements really have defined you know technology in modern life. Um, one of the reasons I, I chose to look at this is there are hard limits to to what to what we refer to as a law. Um, there's real chemical boundaries here, and and everyone knew uh, ever since the transistor was invented that eventually we'd we'd hit these limits. It's always just been pretty far off into the horizon, um, but now we're looking. You know, maybe maybe in the next five years, there might be some some tough limits as to as to how well electronics and and semiconductors can improve. Um, and so we had the, the opportunity. Uh, we can go into a little more about the top down uh, scenario discussion we have, where where we took a little break from from the day to day work of looking at companies to try to try to have some discussions about trends that we we see over the next five or ten years. Great. And so um, maybe just on a little bit more on why why exactly we do that um, or, or how we do it. Um, are you given sort of freedom as to where, what you want to explore or topics? That's right. So I think I think there's um, I, I think there's kind of two two big issues here that have to be balanced. And and if we go to I know in previous podcasts, different different people have talked about how we're constantly trying to optimize you know people's time. So I think two big issues we we try to we try to find the right balance to. One is, you know, we, we definitely want an independent voice when it comes to research. And, and that would suggest people should work very autonomously, at least in the, the kind of the first half of, of investment research. Um, we are a global team and we do want to share ideas as well. So how do, how do we balance the two? You know, how do we balance people's time between uh, real independent autonomous work versus, you know, sharing the best ideas across the team? Um, the second thing we try to balance is, you know, we, we do do very careful company specific diligence and there's always new products companies are releasing. There's, there's always new announcements. There's always market changes. Um, there's always ideas that, that we could consider investing in that we're not invested in yet. Uh, and so, so how do we balance time between going through all these company details with, with taking a step back and just looking at, at larger trends. And so these are, these are two things we're constantly trying to optimize and, and constantly trying to balance when, when it comes to people's time. You know, I think we have a few events per year. Uh, this was one of them um, where instructions were just given to the whole team. Take a step back. Uh, take any any high level topic you want. It could be about something we're currently invested in, something we're not invested in yet. Um, and 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 just explore it and, and share it with the team. Uh, and so, yeah, this one, this was one of these things where, again, we deliberately moved away from autonomous work and company specific work to more to more sharing and again, a little bit more high level abstract type type research. Great. What, what is Moore's Law? Yeah. So um, if you go through the whole history of, of digital electronics, the, the key device is, is this idea called the transistor. Mm -hmm. um, that was invented shortly after World War II. Uh, and, and what people realized soon after was you could make uh, multiple transistors uh, on the same starting block of uh, silicon, I may, and I, maybe the first one was made out of germanium, but but we think about making multiple uh, transistors connected to each other on on a single starting block of silicon. What people found was uh, we kept getting more and more and more, and we were making each transistor smaller and smaller and smaller. And what what that allowed was was much uh, higher performance computing, much more memory. Um, and and you hear these stories like uh, you have more computing power in an Apple watch today than, than the entire planet had in the, in the fifties and sixties. And that's true. And, and the idea is we kept shrinking, uh, this, this core building block, the transistor, um, smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's the idea of Moore's law. Um, you know, I'll, your next question might be, okay, so why is it ending? But I'll, <laughs> I'll let you get to your, <laughs> your next question. If there's something. Well, I, I was going to ask two things. Uh, maybe just yeah. first, why silicon? What's special about that? Are there other materials that, um, could do the same job? 
That's right. So I'll, I'll take a step back. Um, the word semiconductor is 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 actually not a very good word. <laughs> um, you know, we think <laughs> so. So what it there's there's you know uh, real uh, conductors. You know, we think of like the the copper wiring in our house. And, you know, there's, there's real insulators like, uh, you know, plastics or, or different coatings that are on the outside of the wire that, that prevent us from getting shot. What a semiconductor really is, is, is an insulator that fails when we want it to fail. So, so if you were to take pure silicon and, and you were to make it very cold, you, you'd realize it's, it's just an insulator. The, what's nice about it is there's a, the way the electrons line up at, at different energy levels. Um, it's, it's controllable that we can... Um, you know, at room temperature and with different impurities, we can make it a conductor when we want it to be a conductor. But for most of the time, it's it's an insulator. Um, there's other other materials uh, people use um, for very high powered applications, uh, like in electric cars or in in transmissions, uh, like grid transmission. Um, people would use silicon carbide. They could use gallium arsenide. Uh, but for electronics that we have around the house, uh, silicon is very cheap. It's very well understood. Um, and it has the right power levels. Every, everything fits for what we think of as, as traditional electronics. Okay. And then the next question I think you, you saw coming was just, well, how precise are we now? How small are we talking? Can you provide us with some context as to why we might be meeting those, those chemical limits today? Sure. Um, so, so one thing before, before I get into it, um, you know, industry observers will will hear uh, these references to transistors today being made on a, a three nanometer process or a two nanometer process. There's there's an, a very unusual marketing, um, or it's just kind of an industry practice in the semiconductor industry. What they call a, a three nanometer transistor, um, it's it's off by about a factor of fifteen, and that's that's just for legacy reasons. So so you're going to hear me talk about much larger numbers, and and what I point out is these these industry references. It's it's well understood that they're it's it's just for legacy reasons that they call it these smaller numbers. Um, so, so what sets this limit? Uh, I, I said you know very very pure silicon uh, is inherently a, an insulator. The idea when we when we make a transistor uh, is you start with very pure silicon and then you add a very faint amount of of some other material. Usually it's it's phosphorus or boron. And when I say a very faint amount, um, it's about one in ten thousand atoms at most. At most, it's usually much less than that. It's probably more one in a hundred thousand, one in a million. Mm -hmm. um, a transistor needs needs three of these uh, regions and, and with these kind of back to back junctions. So if you, if you do the math on that, at at the fewest number you could have, if the doping level is one per ten thousand, would be three thousand atoms. Now that's a that's a peculiar limit that assumes you can make this thing absolutely perfectly. You know, one foreign atom in the in the middle. Uh, I guess nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine <laughs> atoms around it. Um, but we can't make it that way. We make it with these, these industrial processes that have, uh, all, all different, um, random diffusion around it. Uh, the atoms are wiggling all around. So we have to be a few orders of magnitude off from there. Um, if you back this up, it just as a rough rule of thumb, a million atoms, a million silicon atoms, as far as they're, they're spaced away in a, apart from each other in a crystal would be a cube of about 30 nanometers. And a nanometer is one billionth of a, of a meter. Now, there's a long series of cascading assumptions I've made uh, having to do with the doping levels, having to do with um, random diffusion and just kind of statistics to make this all work. Uh, the shape, you know, these things aren't perfect cubes. There's there's different shapes they, they can make these out of to sort of save real estate, if you will. Um, but that's that's kind of how you end up with these numbers around in, in the ballpark of, of 30 nanometers. Um, more importantly uh, than than, than this math, there's uh, an industry consortium. It's called the IEEE. They do the standard setting for, for all of electronics. And every year they get the whole semiconductor industry together. So these are the semiconductor designers, the, the tool makers, the, the chip buyers, um, academics. And they put out a, a manufacturing roadmap of what everyone expects is going to happen for the next few years. And if you look at that roadmap this year, they talk about uh, transistors where the, the midpoints, the gates are about 48 nanometers apart. The pace of that shrink is is definitely slowing, and in about five years' time, it flattens out. Now, there's other engineering tricks that are that are going on. Um, there's there's ways to build transistors on top of each other, uh, but but generally speaking, this this whole this whole pace is really slowing down. And this is the entire industry getting together and saying, "Yeah, we're kind of we're kind of reaching the end." I I, I mean, I'm blown away by just how small we're talking here. Like the 
wavelength of visible light tends to range between 300 and 750 nanometers. So, so we are at a fraction right. of that. And I, I just wonder, because I, I find it so interesting, can you talk about just the technology that we've developed to be able to etch the silicon at, at this level of precision? Yeah, so so you 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 nailed it, right? So visible light, um, uh, what is, it's about three hundred to seven hundred nanometers. Uh, these are made with laser sources that are in um, pretty pretty deep into the in, into the ultraviolet. You know, it's not it's not quite X rays, but it's way out there. Um, there's all sorts of uh, physical alignment tricks to keep these lined up, um, and and yeah. So the main advancements really was uh, this this whole, particularly on the optical side, getting these laser sources and and all these controls. Uh, you know, handling light again far into the ultraviolet uh, spectrum. Um, you know, just just to to back up the way the way these semiconductors are made. For for our older listeners who have ever been in a photography darkroom, uh, you know, the idea of having you know what what we call the film negative, it goes into a machine and and you shine a light through it, and there's a chemical reaction where the light hits and where it doesn't. Uh, in the semiconductor industry, we the semiconductor industry uses that. It creates sort of a stencil, um, and there's different coatings that are put on top of it, and then you have you do this over and over again, and you build up a, a you know kind of a series of, of patterns and coatings. Um, but yeah, I mean the precision here is incredible. You know, if we think about um, you know the time of year now for our Canadian listeners, when when we think about how precise or not precise our door frames and our window frames are, I mean these these are off by trillions and trillions of atoms. Uh, you know, and, and here we're counting, again, thousands of atoms. So, I mean, this is many, many, many magnitude, uh, orders of magnitude off from kind of our day-to-day -day, uh, experience. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been an incredible success, but, but it's kind of ending is, 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 what, um, is what's changing now. Okay. So, I guess from there, I'm struck by, by two things. One is, um, so it's ending, and I think there's a narrative that just Moore's law and the way that it's developed uh, over the years, almost metronomically, has been such a driver of productivity and and advancement. Um, you know, even the way that we're recording the podcast today is uh, as a result of the advancements in in Moore's law. So so that's the one side, but then the other side is just even if it does level off, just the sheer difficulty and draw dropping science that goes into actually doing this today. Um, it's still crazy hard to do this, is it not? Yeah. Um, so, so let me, let me answer the second question first and then I'll, I'll get to the first one. Um, it is, and, and I'd say there, there's certainly, uh, steps, steps of this, that, that there's really only one company in the, in the world that, that, that can, that can serve this. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about the lithography stuff that ASML does mm -hmm. there, there, it's really the. Uh, th that's that's a true monopoly business. Um, it, it is very sophisticated. There's only a few locations in the world that are, are really pushing this limit. But but what we wonder is, um, if you look through the history of the industry, there, there was this constant leapfrogging, right? One company would build a new uh, factory with all this equipment, uh, spend billions on it, and then and then you know within months that was obsolete because because another company came around and uh, and, and built up this new system. Uh, and they were the leaders now. So there was this constant leapfrogging, and and when when times were rough, companies would go bankrupt if they were even briefly leapfrogged. What's what I think is more likely to happen uh, over the next five years is is there is this steady state where, um, yeah, again, I, I don't I don't think it's going to be a very uh, there's not going to be dozens of competitors, but but at least this leapfrogging will go away, and and there'll be some some more consistency about the. The useful lives of of the manufacturing equipment that companies buy, and and um, again, neither, neither the benefits of, of being the the winning leapfrogger, nor nor the pain of of getting leapfrogged. Um, now, the earlier question, sorry, can, can, can you remind me what the first? Well, I'm just, the early was. question was more about my iPhone. I mean, we tend to replace yeah. our phones every two to three years, and um, you know, there's a big gap between the iPhone one and uh, you know the iPhone X or whatever I've got today. Um, it's it's a <laughs> huge deal. But I, I'm just wondering with the slowdown in, in Moore's law, or if we are reaching the end, um, does it matter mm -hmm. as much if I keep my phone for the next four or five years? Like I, I'm, I'm just not going to see the improvements that we've seen historically. And so just going back to productivity and, and thinking the economy at large, what does the end of Moore's law yeah. imply there? So that's, that's what, that's what we were hoping this, this whole research was, was going to be about. Um, you know, I, I know the chemistry sounds complicated, 
uh, again, I, I think the chemistry is pretty straightforward. And, and if, if, if the industry participants are, are putting out roadmaps that, that kind of say, yeah, it's slowing down, um, I, you know, I, I think it's a very trustworthy source. What I try to do is I, I try to, you know, say, well, what's, what's the impact for, for global productivity? And this is a very hard question. And I'll be honest, uh, you know, I shared this with the whole group. I really came up with nothing. <laughs> um, no, and, and I, I don't, I don't, I, I'm grateful that I, I work with a team that, that, that accepted that as an answer. Certainly, you know, there's no research we do that, that we're just trying to create attention or generate a trading activity or something like that. Um, what, what I mean, I came up with nothing was, so first there's been this, I, I guess what some economists call the, the productivity paradox mm -hmm. of the last few decades, more like the last decade, there was a lot of corporate spending on it. Um, and it just hasn't shown up in the, in the productivity numbers. I, I think there's, if you look at, uh, these, these good macro sources, like the OECD, you'll, you'll find a lot of material about this. This is a little bit of a mystery in the first sure. place. Um, I can give a few of my own ideas of why, of, of, of why Moore's law won't, or the end of Moore's law, uh, law won't won't be too disruptive to the global economy. Again, this this is something I couldn't find an answer to, so don't I, I can't I can't put a lot of numbers and precision around this. I I think there's a few layers to it. I think first there's um, there's a lot of productivity improvements that aren't in what we consider core technology areas. So so if you think about something like uh, big box retail, like Costco. Um, I think most families would recognize that that was a very, that improved, uh, shopping efficiency. Uh, that was certainly a productive enterprise. Do we think of Costco as a, as a tech company? Mm -hmm. You know, certainly not. It's, it's just, it's just buying in bulk. Um, I think one layer down, there's, there's a lot of opportunities for technological gains out, outside of what we consider the traditional information technology sector. So if you look at something like a, like a Tesla, okay some great computation there, but, but things like the batteries and the motors, it's not really semiconductors, mm. you know, there's other power semiconductors in the supply chain, but, but again, you know what I mean? There's, there's just, there's, there's other material science that's in there. Uh, healthcare diagnostics, again, not, not necessarily having anything to do with Moore's law. So I think, um, when we look at across the world of technology and improvement, and by the way, even within it, there's a lot of other non semiconductor stuff, there's uh, wireless coverage, and that's that's cement and steel antennas all over the place. Um, there's there's software delivered through cloud services where uh, rather than have all the clients out there doing their own maintenance, just the provider does the maintenance for everyone. That's a real efficiency gain. Um, so I think there's just many factors that ended up really, I'd say watering down a little bit the impact of, of Moore's law on, on, on global GDP. And at, at least what I shared with the group was that this probably is a little bit more of a, an industry specific consequence rather than a, um, global growth, uh, factor. Okay. Can, yeah. can I go back to, um, just more micro implications, although some of these companies are pretty big, Yeah. recognizing that it, it may take us uh, a few years for Moore's law to, to really sunset. Um, mm -hmm. I mentioned Apple earlier. What what does that mean for Apple? Sure. Um, so so a few things. Uh, before before I answer the Apple, so Moore's law, let's say, it does slow down. There's always new engineering tricks. There's there's always a few additional things to do. Uh, again, you you can build transistors on top of each other. It's not necessarily as as thrifty as making them smaller, but but you can get more out of it. There's there's slightly different geometries you can make with it. Um, and then and then possibly you know much longer term. Um, non-silicon materials, quantum computing, there's, there's, there are potential breakthroughs in, in, I guess what we consider digital electronics today, okay. but getting to Apple. Yeah, this is tough. I mean, you think about, uh, inside an iPhone, there's, there's limited real estate for, for semiconductors and you have only so much computing power there. Uh, and I know there was these jokes going around, um, about how the last iPhone was, was a little bit underwhelming. And, and I think in five years, it's going to be a lot more underwhelming, um, unless there's something they can do outside of the the processing and the memory. I, if there's a whole new I don't know, tactile system or a whole new uh, camera system, there might be something there. But yeah, the the real horsepower under the hood. Um, the, the real estate is tight, so you can't just you can't just add twice as much. And prices might go up. Um, you know, the the cost per per area of uh, semiconductors actually has been increasing. You know, to as as the processing became more and more intense. Um, now it was compensated for with, with kind of cheaper per computing stuff, but, um, 
Yeah, I think I think the future uh, iPhones are going to be a as underwhelming as they've been. Um, <laughs> and I'm sorry to say it, and, and maybe even more expensive. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll toss up some other examples. Uh, one, one, you know, we, we, we have Amazon in the portfolios. Mm -hmm. uh, their, their computing infrastructure that they lease out called AWS. This has been a huge success, great business, uh, great future ahead of it. Um, they've certainly benefited from, from constantly having you know, faster, cheaper semiconductors that they would buy and, and lease out to people, you know, cheaper memory, cheaper processors. Um, that, that might slow down for them or, you know, that kind of benefit on the procurement side might, might slow down with them in five years. And, and again, I'd, I'd caution, this isn't the only factor that's affecting these companies five years out. There's, there's plenty of reasons and, and plenty of different scenarios we can discuss uh, where things can go right and things can go wrong for these businesses um, within five years and beyond five years. But yeah, I, I think I think this is going to hit those kind of companies. Um, again, you'll start to see the slowdown as we approach five years and beyond. Then, just the the cadence of improvement will will moderate. Okay. And you talked earlier about uh, TSMC and ASML uh, specifically, but mm -hmm. what about some other companies that are in that semiconductor uh, supply chain or equipment manufacturers? Yeah. So I'll tell you, I had a I had a really good discussion with uh, with Alex on this. So my 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 kind of first reaction when I was researching this is I said, well, this is great for the equipment companies because at the if you want more computing, if computing demand is strong, uh, and you don't get more computing per area, you just need more area. And and all these uh, machine companies they they ultimately sell, um, you know, processing time on on area per on an area per time basis. Mm -hmm. So I said you're just going to need a lot more. You're going to need a lot more of these tools. Um, and this was an interesting discussion I had with him. He said, he said, well, you know, you, you think computing demand is strong, you know, let's, let's, let's check that assumption. Um, is computing demand really strong or do people just want the, the next updated thing? You know, so much to say is, uh, you can do, you can think about computing, uh, computing demand in terms of, I don't know, some, some sort of combination of bits and speed and, and, uh, uh, storage or something like that. Um, if, if, uh, uh, is that is that really how demand is created, or is just when there's a better chip out there, people want the better chip, right? Like, does does demand drop in half if if things really are stagnant for a while? And that was an interesting that was an interesting debate we haven't we haven't quite quite figured out yet. Um, and we we do have other exposure around there. Um, you know, just just so the listeners know, I don't think uh, we we don't we don't have a particularly high weight in technology. I mean, we we look at all industries. Uh, we um, we look at all opportunities equally on, on the basis of competitive advantage and, and, uh, you know, discount to what we calculate as a, as an intrinsic value of the business. Um, and even within it, we, we probably have more software and services today than, than we do semiconductors, but yeah, we have, um, we have KLA in the U S mid cap portfolio. That was, that was one of the companies I was discussing with Alex. Um, let me think what else, um, you have Samsung. Uh, in the emerging markets portfolio, so yeah, we have we have a few, but it's not. I just want to make if there's any new listeners, we're we're by no means concentrated in the IT sector just for the sake of, um, uh, you know, any 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 particular growth tilt or or uh, I don't know uh, unnecessary enthusiasm about the sector. I've got a bigger question, which is semiconductors have been at the heart of geopolitics lately. Um, just given their strategic importance in everything that we do, we've heard a lot about China versus the U.S. playing out in Taiwan. What might the end of Moore's law mean for that? Looking out over the next five or ten years. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know the, the whole development of of the semiconductor industry in Taiwan. I mean, this this was an incredible success. Uh, the the idea that designers from across the world could could come there for you know, the, the most sophisticated, uh, you know, library design libraries and, and manufacturing techniques. I mean, this, this was, was really an impressive feat that, that took decades to, to grow. Um, you know, at first guess, I, th I think these are, these are sort of two separate issues. If, if there really is some sort of, uh, unfortunate change from, from the piece we have today and, uh, you know, duplicate capacity needs to be built, uh, you know, across various continents. Um, that's, that's just the 
I think that's just its own effect. Um, now, maybe you know that's that's a fair question. Uh, if things if things slow down, and and back to what I said earlier, it's it's hard to be a sustained leader uh, when when the technology is is stagnant five years out. Um, maybe it's a little easier to catch up, uh, but I'm sure TS, TSMC has very good customer relations, um, it, and it's it's risky to build a whole new fab without existing clients to to get people to come in. Um, so yeah, at first order, I, I, I think they're just two separate, two separate issues, but, you know, taking this to its logical extreme, it'll be easier to catch up to TSMC when there's no consistent technology advances. Right. If you're not leapfrogging, it's easier to, it's easier exactly. to catch up. Interesting, but still really hard to do. Uh, and for those who no. are interested <laughs> in the topic, uh, there's a great podcast, the acquired podcast that did an episode on TSMC. And just fascinating to hear the history of how that all developed in Taiwan and the, the company specifically. Mm -hmm. Mike, any last words? Um, no, I mean, I, I I hope we get the chance to talk about some of the other other ideas we had from this uh, top down scenarios meeting. Well, thanks for coming on, Mike. Uh, a fascinating topic, and I think you're right. I, I suspect we'll dig into a few other topics that came up at that top down scenarios forum over the next next couple months.